For those of you who may be new to the LCC, we're a partnership among public and private groups that works to meet large-scale conservation challenges across the five-state Great Basin region. We have supported a variety of conservation projects on high-priority topics. This webinar series highlights a few of these projects plus a few more. We hope that these webinars can provide a platform for discussion about the research and its application to the Great Basin. We will keep today's presentation relatively short, about 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll reserve the remaining time for questions for the uh, panelists. Since there are a lot of folks on the webinar, we ask that you type in your questions as they arise. We'll read out your questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. So today's webinar is also going to be recorded and available on our website. If you have any colleagues that would like to see this, we'll have it online by the end of the week. So on your screen, you'll notice there's a small collapsed panel in the upper right corner. By clicking on that uh, red arrow, you can expand the control panel. In the expanded control panel, you can send in a question by simply typing your question in. And so we'll use that for handling all the questions. After you press send, it'll go to the moderator and the moderator will handle the questions at the end of the presentation. So right now what I'd like to do though is introduce our speakers. We have Dr. Jim Settinger, Philip Street, and Sean Espinosa. Jim Settinger is a professor of wildlife ecology in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Science at the University of Nevada, Reno, where he's been on the faculty since 2001. Before coming to Reno, he was a faculty member in the Department of Biology and Wildlife at the University of Alaska Fairbanks from 1985 to 2001. Dr. Settinger is a population biologist that is focused on waterfowl and sage grouse. He and his students have been studying sage grouse in Nevada since 2003. Philip Street, who's managing the work that we're reporting on, is a PhD student at UNR. He has more than 10 years experience working with sage grouse, both in Colorado and Nevada. Sean Espinosa is the Upland Game Wildlife Staff Specialist for the Nevada Department of Wildlife. Sean has over 20 years of professional experience in the natural resource field and has dedicated the past 14 years to greater sage grouse management and conservation planning in Nevada and across the range for the species. In addition to serving as a technical contributor to the project that Jim and Philip will be speaking about, Sean has also been a source of funding from the State Wildlife Agency that has supported this and other important scientific research uh, to contribute to management decisions for sage grouse. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to the speakers, and I believe we'll start with Sean Espinosa. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, once again, I'm Sean Espinoza with the Nevada Department of Wildlife here out of the Reno office, and uh, we certainly appreciate the opportunity and are excited about the participation in today's webinar. Uh, so I'm just going to be giving a brief overview and background on the perspective of the project. Um, in 2012, Dr. Sedinger approached the Nevada Department of Wildlife with the idea of monitoring the response of greater sage grouse uh, to wild horse uh, use and the effects that eventual wild horse removal from the Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge would have on the sage grouse population while simultaneously using Hart Mountain National Wildlife Refuge as a control area. Uh, this also involved the recovery and use of a robust data set on sage grouse demographic parameters and vegetative information collected by Dr. Mike Gregg from the Sheldon during the mid to late 1990s through early 2000s as a potential baseline for comparative purposes. We were certainly interested, but also requested that the project be further expanded to include the potential effects of livestock grazing and possibly interactions with wild horse use outside of the Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge within the adjacent via and massacre populations uh, just outside of the, the Sheldon boundary. Um, this expansion would also help us fill uh, a data gap that we thought was necessary to fill outside of the Sheldon where we had very little information on sage grouse habitat use in Northwestern Nevada. 
Um, one thing I will say about the study area is a very large study area in the northwestern portion of the state. And some of the preliminary results that Philip and, and Dr. Sedinger have provided uh, have already given us some valuable information regarding the movement of birds, uh, particularly within the southern portion of the study area, and the importance of particular habitats within the study area. These results have suggested two basic strategies used during the broodering period, which is a critical life stage for sage grouse. That includes use of lower end elevation meadows for a portion of the population and high elevation habitats with dispersed spring sources that are being used by another segment of the population. The information has provided both Endow and BLM Applegate Field Office with some project ideas that we feel will benefit sage grouse greatly in the future. The results have also provided us with further insight into the benefits of certain livestock grazing management strategies that seem to have contributed positively to grouse survival, or at least to late broodering habitat quality. Preliminary results of this research have also shown support for recommendations provided in the sage grouse habitat objectives table within BLM's approved resource management plan amendments for the Nevada and Northeastern California subregion. Additionally, we feel that this research can further help relationships with livestock producers to, to develop some innovative solutions with respect to livestock grazing strategies and may facilitate proposals for the BLM's new outcome-based grazing authorization program. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Sedinger and, and Philip Street. Hi, I'm uh, Jim Sedinger. Thanks, Sean. Um, I'd just like to make a couple of uh, preliminary comments. One is um, uh, Tessa Benke, who's with us today, is a key player in this work. She's a PhD student who came on kind of mid-project and is uh, co-leading the field work with Philip at this point and will be um, has generated some critical analysis, most of which we won't be talking about today, but uh, you'll be seeing in the near future. And I'd also like to mention um, Mike Gregg, who will see a, uh, some data uh, that was generated from the long-term studies that Mike was involved in and other students at Oregon State University in the 1990s and 2000s. Um, and, and Mike really uh, played a role in the genesis of this project. And he and I were talking about analyzing these data a decade ago. And then um, when the opportunity uh, became available to do additional field work, um, Mike has uh, been on board as a collaborator and we're actually um, have incorporated some of his historical data or the Oregon <laughs> State historical data dating back to uh, the late 1980s on Heart Mountain. Uh, into the work and you'll see a little bit of that today. Um, <clears throat> our goals are really, as Sean mentioned, to our longer term goals were to take advantage of the different grazing histories, and I'll get into that in a minute, on three federally managed land units, uh, Hart Mountain and Sheldon uh, National Wildlife Refuges, um, and then Bureau of Land Management land, um, south and west of Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge, where, which have had quite different grazing histories. Um, and our goals have really been a couple fold. One is to just understand um, the relative, if we can, uh, taking advantage of these grazing histories, which I'll get into in a minute, to try to differentiate or to understand the potential impacts of feral horses, which is as you all know, are an important issue in the Great Basin um, relative to those of uh, livestock that are being grazed on federal lands. Um, <clears throat> here you see uh, one of the meadows in the study area with uh, some livestock on it. Uh, and to accomplish these goals, we've been working in three areas. Uh, Hart Ma Mountain National Wildlife Refuge, which removed livestock in the 1990s. Uh, and has not really had uh, numbers of either uh, horses or livestock since then. Um, so it provided us a unit that's been, uh, had no non-native ungulates um, since the uh, uh, 1990s. Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge, which removed livestock a similar period of time, the 1990s to Hart Mountain, um, but as had experienced a substantial increase in feral horses over the 2000s in particular. Um, so it gave us a unit that had horses, horse impact, uh, but no livestock. 
And then um, the Via Massacre, what we refer to as the Via, Via Massacre area of Bureau of Land Management lands south and west of Sheldon, which have both uh, grazing allotments and horse management areas uh, on them. So areas in which both horses and livestock were, are currently grazing. Just a shot, uh, this is, you can see a fenced area with uh, protecting from uh, livestock grazing on Massacre Ranch, although there is a cow in the photo in the protected area. Um, but you can see the, the vegetation change one side of the fence to the other here. Bittner Meadows, another area on BLM land, which is a very important regional sage grouse habitat just, uh, just off of Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge. Quite a few of the Sheldon birds use this meadow. Uh, substantial meadow that's been primarily, um, it is grazed, but typically uh, later season grazing. Um, we're going to rely on um, heavily on a sample of marked females. Uh, our, our main goal, one of the main uh, approaches has been to trap and monitor uh, radio tags hens and then to follow those hens through the annual cycle. We're using um, these birds to both find nests as well as to monitor broods and, and to monitor the survival of the hens themselves in addition to habitat use. Uh, over the first, is this four years or five years? Five four, years. Five years of the study, uh, the uh, crews have trapped 615 hens on the three study units. Um, we're monitoring these birds uh, a couple times a week at least to locate and monitor nests. Uh, and, and we've been follow, followed 655 nests of these uh, radio tagged hens. Um, and for the successful, six, six, successfully hatching nests, uh, we're then following the broods uh, until um, 42 days of age or um, uh, until the brood completely fails uh, to estimate brood survival. And Philip, we're not going to be talking too much about this today. You'll see some results have developed in a new approach to estimating chick survival that relies on uh, using cameras, uh, two cameras for brood so we can estimate detection rate of the chicks and it's working quite well. Uh, the other advantage of this approach is it doesn't require us to flush the brood, so it's reducing disturbance on broods while we get good estimates of chick survival. Uh, we had 215 successful nests, producing 1,143 chicks, and based on the approach that Phillips developed, we have a detection rate of about 0.95, so every time we go out and check a brood, we see 95% of the chicks that are there to be detected. We then uh, do the standard sage grouse uh, vegetation protocols at nest locations and at weekly brood locations. I didn't mention we, we were following these broods once a week. Um, and then at a series of random points, uh, basically the intersecting transects where we're um, estimating shrub cover using only intercept approaches and a set of Dobmeyer plots, plots along the transects to estimate forb cover, grass cover, grass height, those sorts of variables. Pretty standard sage grouse kinds of methodologies. And over the five years of the study, we've uh, measured vegetation at 2,600 plus veg points. So substantial data set. And we're at, uh, to, we're taking advantage of these different grazing histories um, on the three land units, but we wanted a better approach to assessing um, areas that both livestock and horses had been using. Obviously, everybody knows that horses and cows don't distribute themselves evenly across an allotment or a horse management area. So in the first four years of the study, we uh, randomly selected one kilometer transects. Uh, the crews walked these transects and located uh, either horse or cow feces either side of the transect. And we use distance sampling approaches. That's, we're not going to get into the details of that right now, but it basically allows us to estimate the proportion of feces that we detected along the transect. In the last year, Philip modified this so that we're still doing one, one kilometer transects, but we're now estimating or counting feces at 20 points along each transect. And the reason is that this allows us to better relate our counts of feces to uh, topographic variables and other features that we're going to use to um, uh, model horse and cow use on the landscape. There's some 
feces. Uh, <laughs> and the, over the first five years of the project, the crews have walked 300 kilometers of transects. So um, if you haven't figured it out by now, the kids that are out there are working their butts off. Um, and located 26,000 horse or cow feces. Um, so then we're going to take these uh, fecal transect data. Um, we can translate those into, those into horse and cow use days using standard uh, defecation rate estimates. That's not too critical because what we're really interested in, it's important in terms of translating, you know, how many cows on an AUM and that sort of thing. But what we're really interested in is the variation in horse and cow use of the landscape. So we're going to take these transects, uh, each one associated with an estimated number of feces, and we're going to model the density of feces as functions of a series of variables, topographic variables like slope and aspect, elevation, topographic index, distance to water, those sorts of things, to produce surfaces of horse and cow use on our study areas, and you'll see those in a minute. Um, we also adjust for uh, animal unit months on the allotments. We get those data from BLM. So we can actually correct our estimates a bit for how many cows we knew were on the allotment. Um, the same with uh, abundance of horses in HMAs and on Sheldon. Um, we're allowing these things to vary across years. Uh, horses were removed uh, from Sheldon following our 2013 and 2014 field seasons, so we would expect to see declines in horse use on Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge uh, over the course of the study, et cetera. I uh, will just show you a couple of examples. Here you see um, our assessment, our estimates of horse use days on uh, Sheldon and Massacre areas. So Sheldon and the BLM land. We haven't done this on Hart Mountain because um, there's really not a lot of point in walking hundreds of kilometers of transects to count zero feces, which is what the result we would get trying to estimate horse and cow abundance on Hart. So you're only going to see uh, horse and cow use surfaces for Sheldon and the BLM land. But you can see if you compare the figure on the left, which was horse use days for 2013, with the figure on the right, which is horse use days in 2016, you can see the substantial reduction in horses on Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge, but also in the, um, on the BLM land as well. Okay. And we're doing this because we're interested in um, being able to evaluate how horse and cow use on the landscape might be interacting with both vegetation variables, things like grass height, which people are interested in, forb abundance, but also sage grass habitat use and life history characteristics. So in some models that you're going to see in a bit, we're going to actually incorporate the predictions from these surfaces into an analysis of vegetation data and analyses of um, sage grass sage grouse life history traits. And a similar surface for cow use. Um, and where you see a substantial reduction in cow use in, on the BLM land, obviously zero on the refuge. Um, between 2014 and 2016, we think this is primarily drought effects, either voluntary or uh, mandated reductions in life stock, stocking rates on the um, uh, grazing allotments on the BLM land uh, through the drought that we had going on at that time. And the results, we don't, we're not going to get into these models in a lot of detail, but they're as you would expect. We're seeing, you know, more use in areas near water. Uh, they like um, intermediate slope and aspect. Uh, they like the topographic index that indicates that they're at an area that's slightly higher in elevation than the immediately surrounding areas, but they tend to be not obviously in the highest location areas because they're uh, often associated with uh, meadow habitats. Oops, okay, how do I go back? That one, okay, good. Um, so what we're gonna see initially is, um, we're going to look at a couple of uh, analyses of the vegetation data in relation to these um, a number of variables, uh, topographic variables, as well as then um, the relationships between vegetation variables after we account for topography, slope and aspect, 
and um, and then can we do we see an effect of horse and cow use on the um, vegetation values that we're uh, measuring? And these are just uh, for the statisticians in the group. These are regression coefficients, but basically, um, and we'll go through these briefly. Not all of them. Um, uh, they're estimates of a value uh, or an effect of a variable on uh, grass height. Um, the little bars to the left of zero mean that there's a negative relationship, so the more of that variable, the shorter the grass height. Um, uh, the little bars to the right indicate a positive relationship. So um, CWD is climatic water uh, um, Deficit. Deficit, yeah, just based on deficit. Um, uh, sand, pH, bulk density. Um, solar is a is a basically a combination of slope and aspect. It's essentially solar incidence on that land surface. Um, NDVI is um, normalized difference vegetation index, which is basically greenness. Um, and uh, what you see here is that um, we tend to get uh, an interaction, although it's very poorly estimated, between um, uh, climatic water deficit and pH for grass height. Um, we get lower, shorter grass heights uh, at higher, at greater bulk density. Um, and here, I think this is partly a reflection of that negative interaction between uh, water deficit and pH. We see a, a bit of a positive relationship between water deficit and grass height. Uh, and a negative relationship between NDVI and graphite. Um, just the seasonal effect on graphite, so we're getting, these are, the Julian dates are standardized. Uh, we didn't shift those to dates. Um, what's the mean date, Philip, roughly on those? Uh, about June 10th. Yeah, okay, so we're getting a peak around, we're getting a peak around June 10th of graphite. Um, lots of variation. Uh, forb cover, this is all forbs, so this would include some weedy forbs as well. Um, and these are, we're not going to spend too much time on these because we've got other issues we want to get into. Um, forbs positively correlated with NDVI, which makes sense. Um, negatively correlated with water deficit, which also makes sense. We expect more forbs in moist, more moist areas, et cetera. And just our forb cover model. Sagebrush um, cover. And I'm not going to say too much about that. So we now want to relate the predictions. So those are models that tell us at a certain um, slope and aspect, uh, on a certain date, at a certain elevation, and an area with a certain amount of moisture precipitation, we would expect certain values for grass height or certain values for forb cover. We're now going to take those predictions and ask um, how they might be affected by horse and cow use days. Um, what you see here is uh, grass height on the vertical axis against uh, predicted cow use, which is coming out of our cow use surface. The grass height spatial is predicted grass height from our purely topographic climate model. And what you see is that uh, in areas that shouldn't have very tall grass, so areas where we expect drier conditions, uh, less grass, we don't see uh, much change in grass height across the cow use um, gradient. So if you look along that axis, it's sort of angling up and left at the bottom there. Um, areas where we don't have much grass, we don't see much effect of, cow, of livestock. However, at the upper end of that, surface um, where we're predicting relatively high um, uh, grass heights, we see a decline in grass height as cow use goes up. That's probably not too surprising to most people. That's sort of what you'd expect. Um, we're not seeing the same response by horses. Now, I, I want to caution, too, that um, just in the last week or so, uh, Phillips detected some 
issues in some of our veg models, so some of this could change through time. And I would I meant to caution at the beginning. These are all very preliminary results. We're five years into this project, but we're you know six months into these analyses. So um, it's fairly complicated stuff, and these models uh, are taking about a day each to run. So it's not the kind of thing we just sit down at the computer and whip out 20 of these in an afternoon. We asked a similar question about forb cover. Um, we're seeing similar reductions in forb cover uh, when we expect a lot of forbs based on the topographic moisture climate models. Um, uh, as cow use goes up, we're seeing substantial reductions in forb cover. Uh, where we predict low levels of forb cover, we actually see a positive association be between forb cover and cows. Um, which could reflect just an association between cows and areas that have forbs in them. We're not quite sure how to interpret that result. And again, a much uh, less dramatic effect um, of horse use on forb cover in these models. Um, minimal effects of either horses or cows on sagebrush cover. Uh, here's the cow. Um, Effect surface. Oops, let's go back here. And the horse effect surface. Again, not much going on, and that's probably not too surprising. Um, we're going to look at some nest survival models and a couple of things. Um, we're going to just look at some temporal spatial patterns in nest survival. These are using modern nest success. Um, models so on the left you see those five panels um, we don't have the heart mountain data yet for 2017 um, those were collected by the refuge uh, and they're working on the analyses um, you can see our estimates for heart mountain for the other four years of the study quite a bit of annual variation and that's summarized in the panel on the right so from very high nest survival um, and these are nest survival to 37 days um, for the sage grouse folks in the audience very high nest survival in 2013 and much lower levels of nest survival in 14, 15, and 16. Um, for Sheldon, uh, less variation and on average, uh, more consistently lower nest survival than what we've seen on Hart Mountain. And on the BLM lands, um, some variation, particularly uh, in 2014. Um, and on both the massacre areas and the Sheldon area, we didn't experience any year as good as the first year on, on uh, Hart Mountain. So we've got lots of variation. We're gonna now take a look at whether we see um, a relationship between um, nest survival. Uh, if, we, if we examine the effects of location, habitat, et cetera, on nest survival, um, in the absence of considering cows or horses, we then see an additional effect um, when we ask whether cows or horses are having an effect. And basically what this is, is uh, those of you that remember your undergraduate statistics, this is just a distribution on a parameter value that's linking nest survival to um, cow use. So in other words, we're asking um, if this is a positive positive number, which it is, then it's telling us that we tend to get better nest survival at higher levels of cow use. That's how you'd interpret this. Uh, horse effects basically largely overlapping zero, telling us that there's very little association between horse uh, use of a piece of land and whether a nest on that piece of land is going to be successful. And these are a combination of the historical data from Oregon State. This is just the long-term pattern on Hart Mountain of nest success estimates. Um, oops. Um, remember, livestock came off uh, in the mid-1990s. And then those last three points out there on the right are our data. Um, there's no long-term trend in nest survival on Hart Mountain. Okay, so we're seeing no effects of removing livestock on Hart Mountain uh, on nest success.
So look at chick survival. This is relying on the new approach that Philip has developed uh, to be submitted for publication very soon. Um, this is what chick survival patterns look like as a function of chick age, very similar to what we would expect and what we see in, in other precocial species, either waterfowl or grouse. Most of the mortality is occurring in the first couple of weeks. These are daily chick survival on the y-axis. And then by the time they're about two and a half weeks old, they're at very high rates of survival. So most of the mortality has already occurred. I'm not going to spend too much time. This is just relating grass height to uh, survival in a series of years and locations. We ask, once we control for environmental effects on chick survival, um, and we now insert cow use of the habitats the chicks are in, um, we see this wouldn't be quite significant at the 95% level. Um, but again, the parameter linking nest or chick survival to cow use is negative, suggesting reduced chick survival in areas of greater cow use. And the horse effect is stronger and more negative. So a very strong negative effect of horse use of a piece of land and the probability that chicks on that piece of land are gonna survive um, that day. We think about adult female survival. Uh, again, these are data on Heart Mountain and a combination of our data, those three points to the right, and uh, data collected by students from Oregon State, including Mike Gregg, historically. We see that post the mid-1990s, a steady increase in the survival of adult female sage grouse on Heart Mountain. And that's a significant positive trend. It doesn't look that great, but you're you're getting annual survival rates now going from about 0.45 to in the neighborhood of what, 0.65, roughly. That's a huge effect in terms of population dynamics of this species. So there's not a direct linkage here, but clearly since livestock were removed from Heart Mountain, we've seen an increase in survival of adult female sage grass. Um, so preliminarily, in our just our vegetation models, we're seeing some effects apparently of um, intensity of livestock use on grass height and forb cover. We're not seeing those same relationships with horses, but as I said, I would caution those results could change um, substantially, and I would stay tuned. Uh, we're not seeing much of an effect uh, of grazing on nest survival. And that's actually consistent with the long-term pattern on Heart Mountain, where we're not seeing any change in nest survival following the removal of livestock from Heart Mountain. In contrast, there's an apparent strong effect of grazing by horses and secondarily by livestock on survival of sage grouse chicks. Um, one other uh, just issue that we'll mention is that um, this is a meadow on this is uh, Hell Creek, right? This is a meadow on Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge uh, from which horses have been removed. Um, there are a lot of forbs there, uh, but uh, they're not the kind of forbs that sage grouse need. That's weeds primarily, and so there are some opportunities that are maybe uh, you might say. Um, a strong case to be made for doing some management on meadows after removal of uh, um, heavy grazing because this you can get a response, at least in the short to midterm, that um, won't be favorable for wildlife um, without some additional um, treatment. And one thing I would mention on the four figures that we showed earlier, we're in the process of going back and looking at key forbs for sage grouse responses. Those four figures you saw earlier were total forbs, which would include weeds. So that's another refinement that we have not yet done that we're um, working on now. Um, 
we're doing some tweaking to the horse and cow use model and incorporating the changes that Philip introduced in this last field season where we've got point counts of feces as opposed to the whole transect because it allows us to more closely tie um, our estimates of density to topographic features, distance to water, et cetera. And there's some technical issues that uh, we mostly worked through in terms of tying those estimates back to the earlier estimates based on transects. Um, we're gonna refine these demographic models. We also haven't spent a lot of time yet looking at habitat use so much by sage grouse, so we wanna look at how they're responding spatially also to horse and cow use. Um, so those are a couple things we um, have planned. In addition to, at least the current plan is to continue for three more field seasons. So we'll have some more refinement. Uh, we'll get some more variation in horse and cow use on these areas as well. Um, And um, there's just a little diagram of indicating, um, we wanna think about incorporating more feedbacks into this system in terms of, um, and also refinements uh, of our estimates of horse and cow use on broods, on nests, um, how are females responding to this? Are we seeing change in distribution of nests, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we've had a number of partners and funders on this work. Um, Nevada Department of Wildlife has been an important funder. Oregon Fish and Wildlife has uh, funded um, part of the work on Sheldon. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, both the LCC and the Nevada State Office are invested in this, as is, is uh, both the Nevada and California offices of BLM. Uh, the Greater Heart Sheldon Conservation Fund um, the Nevada Chucker Foundation and the Nevada Agricultural Experiment Station have all played a role. And we're now in a cooperative, uh, collaborative arrangement, arrangement with the um, Hart Sheldon um, refuge staff where they're collecting the data on Hart Mountain uh, this last year and going forward. Um, and that's just a shot of field life and you happy to take any questions. For the questions, uh, I'll be handing it over to our colleague, Liz, who's been uh, gathering anything that you guys may have sent in through the chat system. If you have any additional questions and you're on your computer, please use that to go ahead and forward those to Liz. We also have a group of people in the room. So I'll let, um, I'll let Liz do some of the questions that she's already gathered. And then as people have in the room here, they can raise their hand and we'll handle those as well. Thanks, John, and this is actually Emma. I'm gonna be handling the Q&A on behalf of Liz and I, um, but thank you very much for the folks that have typed in questions, and please continue to do so, and I'll try to get through as many as we can um, by the end of the webinar, and just a note, that if we aren't able to get through all the questions, uh, we'll have a re record of everyone who asked questions, what those questions were, so we can follow up um, after the presentation as well. But um, to start, there was a question submitted kind of early on just about kind of study design and um, was there an area that had only livestock and not horses in this study? Um, yeah, this is uh, Philip Street. And I just pipe up and say, no, there was not an area that had just livestock. Um, the massacre study, you didn't, there's a gradient of grazing. Um, there are horses across the entire massacre unit, but parts of that unit have very little horse use and heavy grazing. And other parts of that unit have heavy horse use and smaller cow use effects. So. Okay, thank you. The next question is, does the process of nest monitoring reduce nest survival, i.e. through predators following biologists to the nest? Yeah, I, I'll answer that one. <laughs> um, we have uh, we haven't assessed it in exactly the same way in this project, but we have actually a publication in the OCK on exactly that question. And the answer to the question is uh, yes and no. And the reason it's yes and no is the following. What we found was that um, we do see some uh, reduced or well, what we see is nests tend to fail earlier uh, after a visit than they would have otherwise, if that makes sense. But if we control for the habitat features at the nest, 
What we find is that the nests that failed following visits had a high likelihood of failing anyway. So our estimate of the in this other study, and I think it'll be very similar in the in the study that we're currently doing, um, the effect on nest success itself is one or two percent. So it's very minimal. Um, it turns out that there's a substantial, and this is a sort of for the statistics nerds in the audience, there's a substantial effect on your estimate of nest success because the nest failing earlier causes us to get a very strong negative bias in our estimate of nest success, even though there was relatively small effect of visiting the nest on nest survival itself, if that makes sense. And I'm just gonna build off of that answer. Part of the question was, predators following the technicians to the nest. And aside from the initial location of the nest, the technicians never get within 50 meters of the nest. They're told to stay 50 to 100 meters away. And unlike other projects where they're going to specific points and taking bearings, our techs aren't going to the same spot ever. Um, they're usually just monitoring the nest off of a GPS location and the direction from the telemetry. Can you speak a little bit about the technique that you've helped to try and develop for following brood, which is a follow onto the nest itself, I think, and the survival concerns there? Yeah, so I guess the technique for estimating chick survival and monitoring these broods was kind of developed because the only way prior to this to monitor chick survival was to attach a the small radio transmitter, usually one gram or so, to the back of the chick with sutures. Um, and this can have a negative effect on their survival. And most of the studies censor the first day or two of survival um, due to handling effects. And that also happens to be when survival is lowest for the animals. Um, other studies have flushed the birds um, early in the morning while they're still brooding. And these birds are brooding for a reason, and that's because it's cold. Um, so you might also be introducing some bias. Um, so we came up with the idea to locate the hens, put the video cameras on them, and then the hens get up when they're ready. So after the sun's come out, after it's warm enough for those chicks to survive on their own, we feel like this has the least amount of bias or observer bias on our actual estimates of chick survival. Great, Emma, thank we'll take you. One. Emma, we'll take oh. a couple in the room if you don't mind. Yeah. Sounds great, John. And we'll repeat these so we know that yeah. they get heard. Yes. So do we conclude that horses are worse than cattle? I wouldn't say that at this point. Uh, well, yeah, sorry. The question was, can we conclude that horses are worse than cattle? I would just say, I, I would say given the state of these analyses, uh, I would be prepared to say that at this point. Um, and also, I think, you know, we'll see where we are in a couple more years. I would say um, my conclusion or the conclusion at this point would be that both are having some negative impacts on broods. I wouldn't want to rank one over the other right now, given the precision of those estimates and so on. But um, there's certainly a case to be made that. Uh, Horses are having a negative impact for sure, but we're seeing some negative impact of livestock as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure if I understood this correctly. Um, so the technicians don't get within 50 meters of live nests, so are you collecting the nest data after nests either lost or hatching? Or are you collecting that vegetation data? So the vegetation data is collected at the expected hatch date. Um, so either when the nest hatches, we'll go in and collect the vegetation data, or if it's a failed nest, we don't collect the vegetation till it's expected hatch. And that's because grass is still growing throughout the season. But we do visit the nest on the first visit. So that, in other words, we go to the nest once, and then subsequent to that, they're not flushing the hens. They're not getting within 50 meters or so of the nest. So there is a visit early on. And so, it's just verifying that the bird is still on the nest, correct? Right. Yeah. So we check on 
We try to get to each nest twice a week, but some nests only get a check once a week um, to see whether the bird's still sitting on the nest or not. Emma, if you had some others. Yeah, quite a few have come in. Um, I've got several questions here that are just asking if you could um, talk about maybe why there's um, there's an apparent negative effect on chick survival. So um, we had one that was uh, considering that you did not see an observed effect between horse use and veg cover or grass height. How do you explain this apparent negative effect on chick survival? And we also had, could you speculate on why cattle grazing might be increasing nest survival but decreasing chick survival? So I guess I'll address the chick survival first. Um, and I would say one benefit of our modeling approach is that each model is feeding into the other. And it's in a Bayesian framework where we're incorporating the uncertainty from one model to the next. Um, but the fact that we're maybe not seeing a, an effect on the habitat characteristics may identify that our models aren't working super well predicting um, horse use or the vegetation use across the landscape. Um, so while we don't understand the mechanism that's affecting chick survival behind the horses entirely yet, that survival estimate's real. Um, so that effect is real. Um, we just haven't teased out the mechanism yet. And that's something we're working hard to do. I would just mention, I think Phil's been doing some work on the vegetation models in the last week or so, um, suggesting that that horse, the lack of a horse effect might change. Uh, we just, as I said, these things take a long time to run right now. So um, we didn't have time to get those new analyses completely finished before this webinar. So it's possible that horse, lack of a horse effect may not hold up through time. And I think Philip's point is the is the more important one is that when we look directly at horse and cow effects on survival, they're clearly there, um, irrespective of the mechanism. I would say, you know, on the cow use and nest survival, that could be, um, you know, this is still a correlational study, and it may it's possible that cows are just using areas with uh, you know, if we have greater understory vegetation or other factors that are improving nest survival that we're seeing more cows in areas where the birds are doing better. Um, All right, thank you. John, you want me to do a couple more from, from this typed in list? Yeah. yeah, and then we'll, yeah, we'll do a few more and then we'll come back to the room. Okay. Um, we had one that was, were horses removed from the BLM lands between 2013 and 2016? If not, how would you explain the apparently lower level of horse use in those two time periods? Uh, there was no removal that we're aware of. Um, there's also been a significant drought during that time period, and these horses are out there at high densities, which if the habitat's responding to the drought, which we're seeing effects of, then perhaps these horses are dying too. Okay, great. Um, next one would be, um, can you please explain why sagebrush cover has not changed from grazing according to your work? Um, well, I guess, Horses have been documented foraging on sagebrush cover and other studies, um, but I think that it's just cow and horse use is not significantly affecting the sagebrush cover. At least in the time frame you observe. Right, right? in the time frame that we've observed. Yeah. Okay, and I've just got one more methodological question here. Um, are these estimated relationships, i.e. cow slash horse use on nest survival and chick survival from univariate regressions or are they the result of model selection? What other factors are being considered? Um, I'll, I'll start off and then let Phil fill in the gaps. I mean, we're incorporating, these are um, Bayesian analyses that are incorporating horse and cow use and the uncertainty in our predicted values. Um, 
the model structures would be comparable to a standard uh, you know, maximum likelihood approach, except we're using a Bayesian approach so we can deal with the uncertainty in the predictor variables. Um, we've got other variables in there um, as well, and I'll let Philip sort of follow up on that. Yeah, so for the nest survival analysis, there's the interaction between grass height and sagebrush cover, and that's been pretty um, consistent in our data every year we've collected the data, and that is that in nests where you have a higher sagebrush cover and higher grass height, we're seeing higher survival, um, but you need both components. Um, and then the chick survival, there's um, a few habitat covariates going into it, grass height, sagebrush cover, but by far the most important covariates that are affecting chick survival are these horse and cow use surfaces. We had a couple questions in the room. I think Catherine, you had another? I was just going to see with all of those data points whether there was going to be um, the ability or desire in the future to yeah. differentiate um, amongst the livestock using the biomassacre unit. There's a variety of allotments and pastures within that management unit with different seasons of use and, um, you know, the different management in general. Is there the ability? Are the points distributed in a way where that could be looked at? Right. Um, Can you repeat the question? Okay, so the, <laughs> the question was there's different grazing allotments within the massacre area, um, and can we differentiate the timing of use of the cow use or within the those allotments? Yeah. Or the variation in management that occurs within allotments, does that produce right. a signal that you can use that? Right. And so right now, um, the allotments do go into our analysis. They're a categorical for each allotment, meaning that each allotment's able to move back and forth among years. Um, but we're going to incorporate the AUM data, um, so the actual number of livestock, into those models. And then also one component of our models that we didn't spend too much time on, and this is the methods part, is that when we're doing our fecal transects, we're attempting to age the feces. And then when I say age it, we're not trying to age it by the day, just whether that feces was deposited this season or not. And the timing of when we do our fecal surveys are right after the brood rearing season. Um, so what we're really trying to get at is the number of horses and cows that were there either during the nesting season or brood rearing season. So then not only the AUM would be important to know, but also the season of use. Um, I believe you could get all that from the field. I'm up there, all those allotments, I believe, would also free up that. So they have an actual use information. That's yeah. right. And so I guess what I'm getting at is that the timing of use, though, if the livestock are on and the AUMs are after the nesting and brooder in season, it won't go into our analysis. So it's really the spring use that we're interested in. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. It, it, I don't really understand models too well, but it seems like an incorrect or, you know, incomplete portrayal um, of what it might mean for the livestock folks. Right. Yeah, so that's something we can definitely look at too. So do we have any other questions in the room? Emma, did you gather any more online? Yes, we've got quite a few more, so I'll see how many of these I can get through. Um, I'm going to combine these two questions. One's about methodology. They're both about um, about hen survival. So the first one is, is the methodology for determining hen survival consistent across all years? And then the second question is, any ideas why female grouse are trending upward in no graze areas? Yeah, those are great questions. I would just say the, the methodology, I mean, essentially those are um, known fate survival models. 
with a trend across years. Um, so they are consistent across years and we don't have a good explanation for why they're responding the way they do unless Philip wants to add a hypothesis. Um, and I guess the one thing that jumped out at me from those graphs is the earlier years had much higher confidence interval and that's just due to the fact that they weren't marking as many birds in the early years as we are in the later years. Um, and so yeah why the bird survival the adult survival is trending upward um, we don't really have a great explanation for it at this point. I would okay, just say um, I was just going to add we've uh, got some from work in central Nevada where we've shown there you know there are cost of breeding uh, that are being reflected in lower survival of hens later after the breeding season and so this is going to be purely speculation but you know changes that resulted in less stressful breeding maybe the hens are in better nutritional condition or something like that could be affecting survival but we don't above and beyond that we don't really have the data to get into mechanisms um, on those longer term data Okay, thank you. Um, another question was, is there a metric to determine predation level distinctions, i.e. Sheldon slash massacre? So there's not a, a method to determine predation levels. Um, with the chick survival, we monitor these chicks and they're there one time when we check them and then they're not there when we check them again. Our models do separate survival and adoption rates, um, but there's no way to really tell who's eating these chicks in between when we're visiting them. Did you guys incorporate an index of raven abundance or any other sort of indirect measures? Um, we did not incorporate an index of raven abundance. Um, we have been monitoring ravens over the last few years and we have not seen the density of ravens that have been causing these detrimental nest survival impacts in the other part of the state. Thank you. Another question we received was, um, have you noticed any correlations with forbs that are deemed high value, for example, milky sap, asters, tender legumes, tender forbs, versus non-utilized sage, um, SG forbs in the different study areas? Right, so that's something that we haven't quite teased out in our analysis yet, but we're working on it right now. So stay tuned for that question. Sounds good. Um, I've got another one here. Why did you use an indirect measure or index to estimate ungulate use rather than a more direct measure by estimating actual forage use by animal class? Well, I think um, I can get into that a bit. Um, uh, we used an indirect, you know, so if you're going to measure forage use, that's going to be averaged across an allotment or, um, you know, you know how many uh, animals are on an allotment, you can go out and you can estimate forage use, but we're interested in a more fine scale assessment of where the animals actually were. And I don't see a way, unless you're going to put radio tags on the cows, to actually know, um, to be able to relate where the animals were um, to offtake of smaller scale sites. So what we're trying to do is get an integrated assessment of use over, a, as Philip said, over a season, basically a breeding season, a spring and summer. Um, and there's just not, without spending a huge amount of money, there's really not a different way to do it that we can think of. Well, we've spent our hour, and I know there's a lot more questions out there. Um, I'm going to ask that uh, any additional questions, we will make sure that uh, our presenters have an opportunity to review those and answer those. Um, so we'll facilitate the communication on, on follow through on those questions and answers uh, to individual folks that still have them. You can also use the email addresses that are on the screen right now uh, for Jim or for Sean or myself and pass those along that way as well. I want to thank you for attending today's webinar. Again, a recording of this presentation is going to be available on our website later this week. 
if you do, like I said, have any additional questions, contact us and uh, you can use the information on the screen. And last but not least, we really want to know what you thought of today's webinar, so please take our short two-minute survey that will come up after you log out. Your feedback really helps us improve these and plan for future webinars. So thank you. Thank our presenters. And uh, I look forward to the next time we have you on our webinar.